Number theory, a field that transformed how we think about pure mathematics and the nature of numbers. But did you know that there are seven discoveries that followed one another without which number theory would never happen? I know it's a pretty complex field, so let's do our best discussing it. How did it start? The Pythagoreans, a philosophical and religious sect found by Pythagoras in the 6th century BC, is the group that started it all. They were fascinated with their intrinsic properties, like number patterns. This is how the Pythagorean theorem was discovered. It's named after Pythagoras. Pythagoras, but it's possible that the theorem actually predates him, with evidence suggesting similar concepts in Egypt, Babylon, and even China. Anyway, the theorem states that, in a right triangle, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. This was one of the earliest examples of an equation involving integers, which is a fundamental concern of number theory. When you say it's one of the earliest examples involving integers, do you mean that he actually wrote out the equation as we know it now? No, that came later. What I meant is that it describes a relation that can be understood in terms of whole numbers and integers, but the Greeks themselves did not express this relationship in algebraic terms or as an equation as we understand today. Instead, they understood and demonstrated it through geometric means. For instance, the 3-4-5 triangle, where each side length is an integer, and the square of the hypotenuse is indeed the sum of the squares of the other two sides. But even though they did that geometrically, it was still understood as the relation between integers. All right, and when did it start getting more complex? When did we have more abstract considerations of the numbers themselves? With Euclid's algorithm. It's detailed in book seven of his elements, and it provides a methodological procedure to compute the greatest common divisor of two integers. I know it is like an obvious concept for us now, but imagine being the first one to develop that. This was an important development because it moved from specific examples and constructions to a general process that can be applied to any pair of numbers. Wait, so did he use Arabic numerals to develop that? No, right? How did he do it? Let's compare it. The way we would do it nowadays is completely different than the way he originally designed it. Say we have the numbers 252 and 198, and we want to find their greatest common divisor. Divide the larger number by the smaller number and take the remainder. 252 divided by 198 gives a quotient of 1 and a remainder of 54. Replace the larger number with the smaller number and the smaller number with the remainder, the one of the previous step. Divide 198 by 54, which gives a quotient of 3, and a remainder of 36. And you repeat the process until the remainder is zero. Use 54 and 36. 54 equals 36 times one plus 18. Then use 36 and 18. 36 equals 18 times two plus zero. Since the remainder has reached zero, the greatest common divisor is 18. Euclid would have approached it more geometrically, without numbers or algebraic symbols. Consider two line segments of lengths corresponding to our numbers, 252 and 198 units. Measure the shorter segment against the longer to see how many times it can fit without exceeding the longer. Mark off the shorter segment's length until what remains is less than the shorter segment. Repeat this process with the new shorter remainder and the old shorter segment. Continue until the segment that remains is no longer divisible, indicating the smallest common measure. The key word here is remainders, right? Right. Modular arithmetic. It was developed much later, but it extends the concept of working with remainders. It was formalized by Carl Frederick Gauss in his 1801 work, Disquisitiones Arithmetica. Essentially, it's a way of handling numbers where we only care about the remainder after division. In more complex terms, you are often dealing with expressions like this, which reads a is congruent to b module n. This means that when we have a and b and they are divided by n, they leave the same remainder. This idea is directly related to the Euclidean process of subtracting multiples of one number from another until what remains is less than the modulus. Suppose we want to consider two numbers, 17 and 5, and we want to analyze the relationship module 6. When you divide 17 by 6, the remainder is 5, because 17 equals 6 times 2 plus 5. When you divide 5 by 6, the remainder is 5, because 5 equals 6 times 0 plus 5. In modular arithmetic, 
When we talk about modulus n, for example, n equals 6, we're really focusing on the remainders after division by n. The congruence relation groups numbers into classes based on their remainders. So numbers that leave the same remainder when divided by 6 are considered to be the same class. The class of 0 includes numbers like 0, 6, 12, minus 6, minus 12, etc. Because all these numbers leave a remainder of 0 when divided by 6. The class of 1 includes numbers like 1, 7, 13, minus 5, minus 11, and so on. Because these numbers leave a remainder of 1 when divided by 6. This pattern continues for the classes of 2, 3, 4, and 5. So we say that 17 is equivalent to 5 module 6. It means both 17 and 5 leave the same remainder of 5 when divided by 6. Therefore, they belong to the same class, the class of 5. Using this system, where we only consider remainders, simplifies a lot calculations. Oh cool, I get it. But so far we actually haven't said the words number theory. Was Gauss the one who coined the name for the field? There isn't one person it can be attributed to, and we don't really know exactly. But Gauss once said, mathematics is the queen of the sciences, and number theory is the queen of mathematics. It was around this time that the term started circulating among mathematicians. So you could call Gauss the father of the field, but others give the title to Pierre de Fermat, even though he didn't actually name the field. And it's all because of Fermat's last theorem, which states that there are no whole numbers ABC that can create a true equation when each is raised to any power greater than two and then added together. So, no matter what whole numbers and what power greater than 2 you choose, you can't find numbers that make a to the power of n plus b to the power of n equals c to the power of n true. The simple statement remained unproven for over 300 years, and its complexity required the development of many different areas of mathematics, especially in number theory itself. The theorem was finally proven by Andrew Wiles in 1994. His proof relied heavily on the concepts of algebraic number theory, which I want to talk about next. In the description below, you're going to find a math challenge. Please try it and let us know in the comments below your ideas to solve it. Now let's get back to the video. Wiles' proof was quite complex, and I don't want to delve into it now, but if you're interested in knowing how he did it, leave a comment below. And if you're enjoying this video so far, please like and subscribe. Ernst Kummer made one of the most critical advances in algebraic number theory with his introduction of ideal numbers, most notably to prove Fermat's last theorem. He was interested in a special type of number system called cyclotomic fields, which are created from solutions to the equation x to the power of n equals 1, where n is any positive integer. While studying these number systems, Kummer discovered that in certain cases, the usual rules of arithmetic didn't apply. Specifically, not every number could be uniquely broken down into a product of prime numbers, a key property known as the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Building upon Kummer's foundational ideas, Richard Dedekind further refined the concept into what we now call ideals. An ideal is essentially a collection of elements within a number system, ring, that behaves nicely under addition and multiplication. Dedekind also introduced the concept of Dedekind domains, which are special types of number systems where every collection, ideal, can be uniquely broken down into simpler building blocks called prime ideals, similar to how numbers can be factored into prime numbers. This property is crucial for solving complex mathematical problems in a systematic way. Okay, quick little break. I'd like to announce to those who don't know that I give private online classes on any subjects related to math and physics. But this is something that I've been doing for the past eight years. So if you need classes on these subjects, or if you know anybody who does, I might be helpful. You can find my personal WhatsApp contact in the description below. So let me know. Let's go back to the video now. And is algebraic number theory what number theory is composed of? Or how does it work? Are there more fields? Well, algebraic number theory was simultaneously developed with another branch called analytic number theory. It's different because it uses complex analysis rather than abstract algebra, like rings and fields. Euler was among the first to develop techniques from calculus, like infinite series, to explore problems in number theory. 
He came up with ways to use these series called generating functions. And this way he could deeply analyze numbers and their properties. One of his notable achievements is the Euler product formula for the Riemann zeta function, which is essentially a fancy way of connecting prime numbers to a specific mathematical function. Riemann made perhaps the most significant single contribution to analytic number theory with his 1859 paper introducing the Riemann zeta function, extended into the complex plane. Here's the basic idea using the example where s equals 2. You take each positive whole number, square it, and then find the reciprocal of each square. You then add up all these fractions forever. Surprisingly, this sum approaches a fixed number. What makes the Riemann zeta function particularly special in number theory is its deep connection to prime numbers. Riemann showed that this function could be written in a completely different way that involves only prime numbers. This version of the formula multiplies together many fractions, each linked to a prime number like 2, 3, 5, and so on. In each fraction, you raise the prime number to the power of minus s and subtract that from 1. The zeros of the zeta function, points where the function equals 0, are very important because they are believed to be the link to how prime numbers are spread out or distributed among all numbers. And here's a simple way to think about it. Riemann hypothesized that these zeros are in specific spots on the complex number plane, which involves both real numbers and imaginary numbers. If this hypothesis is correct, it tells us that prime numbers are distributed in a surprisingly regular pattern, much more regular than previously assumed. Uh, sorry to ask, but what's the big deal with the zeros? The reason mathematicians care so much about this function and its zeros is that proving where these zeros are located, specifically proving Riemann's hypothesis, would help us to understand much more about the distribution of prime numbers. This has huge implications for mathematics and related fields like cryptography. Honestly, it's quite a pity that we have to stop here, because analytic number theory is full of amazing concepts like complex analysis, Fuchia series, asymptotic analysis, which in themselves impacted many other areas. But for the sake of time, let's focus on the last branch we'll discuss today, the geometric number theory, also known as the geometry of numbers. It was developed slightly later than the more established branches of algebraic and analytic number theory. It began to take shape mainly due to the work of Hermann Minkowski in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. His theory revolved around the relationship between numbers and geometry, specifically using lattice points. Lattice points are essentially the coordinates of a space that are all integers. Imagine a regular grid like graph paper, where each intersection point on the grid represents a pair of integers. Each of these points is a lattice point. For example, the point 2, 3 is a lattice point because both 2 and 3 are integers. Minkowski introduced ways to think about number theory problems geometrically. For example, consider the equation x squared plus y squared equals 5. In geometry, this can be visualized as a circle with a radius squared of 5, centered at the origin of a graph. The lattice points that lie exactly on this circle represents the integer solutions to this equation. One of Minkowski's famous results is the convex body theorem which in simple terms says that if you have a symmetric shape like a circle or ellipse centered at the origin of your grid, and this shape has a large enough area, it must contain at least one lattice point other than the origin. This theorem is powerful because it provides a way that guarantees the existence of integer solutions under certain geometric conditions. My head is exploding right now. That was the gist of it. But if you want something more visual or geometric, check out this video on topology right here. See you there. <laughs>